Hello, I'm Jay Hirsch, Director of Administration of Columbia's ERM program. I'd like to invite you to today's panel on the R Evil ransomware supply chain attack. I'd like to tell you about some of our upcoming events. In the summer, we have two more coding for ERM seminars and two more IQRM seminars. Both of those seminars will repeat in the fall. On September 14th, we have our featured alumni panel. September 16th is the first of our fall mindfulness seminars, and you can register for that right now. And on September 21, we have our CRO spotlight with Philip Sherrill of Arkansas Blue Cross and Blue Shield. And now I'd like to introduce today's panelists. First is Andre Krahel. He's an ERM lecturer and CEO and founder of LIFARS. And Sharyar Shagahi, he's an ERM lecturer and chief technology officer of Quantum Exchange. Gentlemen. Thank you for having us tonight. And we would like to uh, talk today about our evil and uh, supply chain attacks. And I'm very pleased that Sharyar Shagahi joined me and. Uh, will be uh, moderating the uh, discussions and also provide valuable input in our conversation. Everybody, thanks for joining. So uh, the agenda for uh, today is, uh, you know, discussing the actual breach and then uh, talking about different types of attack methods that specifically uh, was uh, applied towards this particular breach. Uh, we'll try to uh, break it down into some components uh, as it relates to the uh, attack life, life cycle. And then there are some supplementary notes from a best practices perspective that we would like to share with you. Uh, some guidelines from uh, FBI and also some countermeasures from Kesaya Advisory. And then ultimately we'll have a few minutes at the end of the uh, presentation for Q&A. If you would, as uh, Jay pointed out, uh, post your questions and uh, we'll try to address them at the end. So with that said, uh, I'll uh, give you a little high level overview of uh, what you see on the screen right now. So on uh, Friday, <clears throat> July 2nd, 2021, not too long ago, <clears throat> there was a attack launch on MSP providers. MSP, as you know, are managed service providers that many organizations are using. Uh, so they have you know, hundreds of clients that they provide various types of services, managed services from security services to IT services. And now, uh, obviously as a result of this type of an attack, more than a million systems were infected and um, anyone that uh, wanted to basically uh, negotiate about a universal decryptor, which is you know, how do I address all of the impacted systems. It was a pretty uh, high price, as you can see, uh, over 70 million Bitcoins, uh, which is you know a cryptocurrency that is widely used in these types of uh, attacks. And then, of course, there was a price tag as so associated with each individual decryption uh, at an endpoint, endpoint meaning that one of the clients, so one of those MSPs, if they wanted to get access to the uh, decryptor, they would pay close to uh, 45,000 US dollars. And uh, as you can see on the right hand side, this is a typical uh, sort of a notification that you get when you get a ransomware attack. They give you a specific dates uh, on the calendar. They basically uh, give you some instructions. And uh, you can see that in this particular situation, they refer to XMR, which is a Monero coin, uh, this type of digital currency or cryptocurrency is a decentralized crypto cryptocurrency that uh, any observer cannot uh, decipher addresses that are trading the transactions, uh, the amounts, the addresses uh, or, or balances or any kind of a transaction history. So it's totally anonymous. And as you know, this is a method of collecting um, you know, financial gains uh, as a result of these types of breaches. So, you know, this, this presentation is more or less like a conversational. So 
I want to just uh, pause here and see if Andre has anything else to add to what I just said. Sure, you really pointed out a good example that Monero was used and we've seen a nation state groups like for example, Lazarus who for example, attack Sony pictures and entertainment uh, using the same conversion from a Bitcoin to Monero. And that's a, I would say a shift in ransomware that we've seen over the last two years that uh, Bitcoin became a little bit more traceable, I would say on and around 80% of the coins that are right now attributed to uh, criminal type of activities, especially in the crypto currency wallets, what we call the wallets attributed to various threat actors. Also, maybe one um, uh, picture to point out on the top is actually Kaseya tagging for, and you see on the top the happy block, that's the actually group uh, are evil. And that's the message they posted, like they don't even hiding to be attacking the Kaseya. And we get into it why Kaseya became a target and how it relates to uh, uh, third party liability. Um, but ultimately it was very calculated attack. We've got the first victim calling on and around noon on Friday. And this was a four, uh, three days weekend. So long weekend in the United States, right? So you're looking uh, at the uh, very calculated attack over the long weekend. Yeah, so um, you can see exactly based on some of the specific activities we talked about um, Kasaya, you know, basically was uh, uh, used as a way of, you know, supply chain risk. As you know, supply chain risk refers to third party risk. So you can basically tighten up your belt around all the required controls when it comes to cybersecurity mitigation program. But unfortunately, the extended enterprise, including some of these cloud-based solutions are now the weakest link at times. And in this case, obviously, our evil ransomware gang targeted Kasaya, which ultimately impacted uh, thousands of customers that were serviced through these MSPs. Um, you know, so there were uh, reported about 1,500 businesses that were obviously impacted as a result of this and you, I mentioned earlier that, uh, you know, the price was not cheap in terms of getting the, the, uh, the, the what was basically uh, encrypted, which we'll talk about, uh, decrypted. Uh, and that basically is uh, shutting down the business at times, huge in, in operational impact, as you can imagine. And maybe importantly, it's also add here uh, to share your point is that, that Kaseya, BSA solution is a very permanent cloud solution for mid-sized businesses. So basically imagine that solution serves the MSP, the um, service provider. And then from service providers, you will have the client of that provider. So it's a very calculated move on the our evil group and a threat actor itself, because they see the chain, how that basically things. And, and now they're tapping into multiple sources for the payments. So it's a nicely calculated uh, on their side. So let's talk a little bit about the, you know, the actual attack method and, and the vector that basically from a compromise perspective. So obviously, as you can see here, um, the internet facing, uh, facing Kasaya VSA servers were targeted by this attack. So this Kasaya, which is an on-prem solution uh, as we mentioned, uh, that is used by variety of MSPs, um, the way that it operates is unfortunately uh, have you know, insufficient separation between client environments. So if I'm an MSP and I'm serving 100 clients, it doesn't have a separation between those clients where you can actually isolate and basically maybe subnet your infrastructure to a way to the point that you can actually manage clients based on a risk -based perspective differently. And that's one of the uh, uh, you know, ways that these guys were able to exploit and, and leverage these types of techniques, uh, including authentication bypass, arbitrary file upload, or code or command injection. So uh, if you want to add a little color, uh, Andre, in terms of uh, this particular attack method, so if we look at that exploit and we uh, highlighted some of the migrate type of framework is, is something what we call the chain technique. 
meaning that it's not just a single exploitation of potential vulnerability. These are military type of strategies. We also often call them direct cyber actions, meaning that they change the command. So no need an authentication can upload any file to the target, then ran any command on the target. Right? So this is almost like a military practice. So it takes a significant time to actually create such an exploit that can compromise that uh, system. So uh, it's not believed that the exploit was uh, just simply created. It's a, uh, we'll get into the conversation. It seems to be that we actually leak from uh, almost like a repository of certain agency that would have such exploits actually available. Also, threat actors and our evil were very skilled in clearing logs after the attack. So they went right into the system and deleted just literally just few lines. We are truly talking just few lines of a code that actually needed to be deleted. So there's nothing really substantial on heavy on their side to actually uh, uh, clear it. Uh, and I, and I, um, can uh, cannot say more about what the Sharia pointed out. The major one of the major weaknesses of the software was truly that uh, when they designed the software, there was no separation, right? And then they didn't think about it that these clients actually would have to live in some type of isolation on their platform. Yeah, and that's kind of what we cover uh, as part of our ERM program, you know, security by design, and that is exact exactly an example of where when they developed this software and pushed it out to these MSPs, they didn't think about security by design, otherwise they would have been able to kind of segment it. You know, and, and one of the things that, and I know, uh, you know, uh, if they were not announcing who they are, basically from a standpoint of this type of, uh, this particular example, when they were able to clear the logs, uh, you know, from a foran forensics perspective, Andre, would that be, would have be, would that have been a difficult situation to be able to understand who did the job? Oh, definitely, and and Sharia, there were multiple uh, IP addresses sources used. So threat actors literally use different IP addresses or different sources for exploitations of the system, and then different IP addresses for actually accessing the system. So they ran it from uh, multiple uh, sources just to cover as much possible the track and also the traces where uh, they are coming from. And the original IP addresses, you're right on a point here that the addresses from which actually attack happens, so from those almost like a hidden shelters on the internet, they try to clear those. They, they were not masking as much the IP addresses for the deployment of ransomware. They're com they were literally coming from out, uh, out of the Amazon cloud. Uh, so there are some links in here in, in case you wanted to kind of uh, get additional information uh, more than what we've uh, what we're going to be able to cover in less than an hour. But uh, you know, based on what happened with this particular ransomware attack, uh, and uh, you know, some of the highlights or seven deadly sins of the future ransomware attacks footprint is uh, listed that we wanted to kind of cover from a standpoint of uh, uh, characteristics. As Andre pointed out. This was a chain exploit, um, obviously have much higher impact in terms of number of endpoints. Uh, and of, of course, uh, based on the, the individual group that you know, initiated this attack, they, they're very much of a nation state and military style type of attack. Uh, to that extent, uh, the group continues to be well-funded uh, from variety of uh, previous ransomware activities. And if they're a nation state, Sometimes the adversary nations would also contribute to that, to that, in, to that involvement. Um, uh, you know, the Russian government will not control the usage and leakage of uh, cyber weapons and intelligence used for criminal activities. They will continue pretending that this is this is not happening, and this is something that you've seen across all different types of uh, breaches that are sort of nation state cross border. You know, most governments. Um, are denying the fact that they're supporting these types of uh, organizations. And if you also look at the point to uh, uh, especially the ransomware groups, like we actually do know two individuals um, behind this uh, cyber attack in a group. And I can tell you that they started career as a basic program is moving up to the ladder and now becoming more in a command and control 
we also see the investment ecosystem, meaning that it's almost like a Silicon Valley. These groups are created for a period of two to four years, meaning they're already funded with the fraudulent Bitcoins. Why Bitcoins? Because some of those coins are now hard to cash. It's hard to move a fraudulent wallet that's already being um, discussed and already being known to actually an exchange and cash funds from it. So some of the groups do have a hard time to actually get cash out of it. And uh, they basically funding a new operating activities for new uh, ransomware uh, groups. It's, it's enough that the government literally just closes the eye when individuals take a USB with some of those exploits. And when you're looking at a style of exploit is perhaps not exactly SVR type, uh, in terms of the coding, but ultimately maybe just someone said, look, here's exploit, but don't use the whole code. Just you have to modify a little bit so it doesn't look like this weapon came from uh, this shop. And I would also say that another trend, uh, Sharia, what we've seen is that some of these ex-military operators of these agencies are truly just right now finding uh, retirement in this, meaning that they are, they are the cyber weapon. They know exactly how to conduct the cyber military missions. And mm -hmm. it's truly and equal to an enterprise to deal with it. Imagine uh, uh, two jets flying over your house and shooting two Tomahawk rackets. I mean, there's not much probably normal enterprise can actually do. Exactly. And, uh, you know, to that extent, um, there is always a lot of data exchange between government entities and agencies and private sector due to the nature of the beast. You know, we live in a very integrated environment. And uh, in recent, you know, months because of escalated uh, attacks, obviously ransomware is one of the most common ones, but uh, there has been target in a lot of uh, critical infrastructure, you know, utility and power which, you know, as a result of these successful attacks, you know, the uh, organizations from at the federal level have started to escalate the need for collaboration between government agencies and private sector. Uh, you know, we've always had these shared uh, information platforms that, you know, started with banking uh, post 9-11 because of a lot of uh, terrorist financing uh, and creation of Patriot Act, which, you know, created the whole KYC AML, uh, you know, requirements to financial institutions. And then, of course, highly regulated industries have, have always been um, kind of moving in that direction. But now this whole collaboration between government and private sector is a big, big noise in the marketplace. So... Uh, one thing you see from a standpoint of other observations, uh, third-party liabilities uh, is, uh, you know, one of the reasons that these types of uh, uh, high-paying ransomware targets are selected. As uh, Andre can uh, point out, based on all of the work that he does in this space, um, the bad guys have access to a lot of organizations, insurance coverage and policies, and be able to really know where, where is a good place to throw your you know, net and be able to collect as much money as possible because of those types of coverages. The insurance, cyber insurance has been a pretty much of a uh, uh, interesting area, very busy area. Uh, and you know, I've been involved with uh, working with some of these insurance uh, organizations where they are find, you know, trying to enhance the way they evaluate uh, the coverage and coverages and policies that they can issue to organizations using a risk-based approach. Obviously, unlike, uh, unlike PNC, property and casualty types of policies where the science of actuarial sciences is the parameter for uh, them to be able to come up with, you know, what's their loss and coverage and and uh, variety of attributes related to that policy uh, with cyber coverage is kind of uh, interesting because it's not actual sciences doesn't work in cyber. 
uh, what you need to do is apply a variety of models to be able to come up with, um, you know, how you measure ultimately the, you know, per probability of, uh, you know, occurrence and, and what's the percentage of uh, impact to the value to the organizations. And these are all derived from how mature are different layers of control in your organization. And so although this has been around for a number of years, but I still think that uh, this is a still a, you know, a, a playing ground for a lot of organizations to kind of figure out how to provide various types of evidences that they have built resilient in their environment so that they can get better premiums from the insurance coverages. But as you'll hear from Andre, which he deals with this type of uh, situation on a daily basis, that's really one source of data for these bad guys to go after. They don't just go and say, let's go after, you know, 500 uh, uh, organizations of this particular industry. They do their homework up front to be able to know that, you know, uh, they, these, or these target organizations would end up paying part of that payment through their insurance coverage. Sure, right on the point. And uh, if you look at the colonial, for example, compromise, it's a third party liability data exposure, basically uh, doing something what we call a publication. And, and we'll get into that at the bottom with a commercial general of the liability uh, reasoning of the Fifth Circuit decision on, on this issue, where um, that plays a significant role. The company might be able to restore and might be able to recover, but a third party liability, the disclosure of information disclosures of third party data. In insurance, we have something, what we call the first party disclosure and third party disclosure. First parties are basically related, let's say to directly to employees and a third party to all your third parties you work with. And it might be actually a substantial amount of information that these companies do have and possess and might not be able to contractually even disclose or uh, be um, publicly available. Threat actors like are evil they created their own site in the network, what we call Tor, and they post the data and they post a line and which basically has a counter how many days that entity has to negotiate a ransom until the data is publicly available. So um, they can be truly substantial, 10 times more even what the ransom actually is. And as Ashari pointed out, insurance premiums and uh, umbrella coverages, meaning the limits, are pretty much known to these groups. And they usually got the data from various marketing efforts, various spreadsheets and uh, competitive analysis. It's, it's not very uncommon to know what the actual insurance premiums are at these uh, enterprises. Another important fact in here is that um, federal enforcement is tracking on the uh, laundering the cryptocurrency as, uh, as from, from these fraudulent wallets. There was a conference in a hog where almost 300 members came in, but still there's no international cooperation, basically. The same that perhaps exists in banking does not actually apply to cryptocurrency exchanges. So if too many right now cryptocurrency exchanges in a country is where it's much easier to actually launder money into it. And while you might be talking maybe only up to three, five million dollars, still on an annual basis that, that's substantial, uh, cash for the criminals to actually conduct their activities and maybe keep the rest of it uh, in, in the pocket. And as I was pointing out in here, the risk transfer is not something that is more acceptable anymore. Like you have a technical error and omissions, ransom and kidnapping coverages, uh, commercial general liability. But the main challenge is that since, as Sharia said, is this insurance um, coverages, the limits are already disclosed. It's it's basically the risk transfer would not work for the ERM. You kind of have to calculate that what you already have is being actually disclosed to the trade actors and you will need to deal with the situation. What we've seen is that the, many of the enterprises actually select their own counsel and their own firm to actually deal with the coverage uh, in supplement with the insurance carrier. Um, the last one I want to point out in here, and I shared this was very interesting. I, I love the legal world, is the commercial general liability and the uh, recent five, Fifth Circuit decision on a treatment of publication. And while the federal court denied the um, plaintiff claim, then uh, the carrier 
had a duty to defend its insurance under coverage B, what we call the coverage B, personal and advertising injury, and then a commercial general liability policy for a claim arising out of that data breach that the data would be actually um, uh, available. So that was actually a very interesting uh, decision from a fifth circuit uh, court. And uh, what happened was actually that many of the carriers took the approach where they made an exclusion to uh, the publication and to that uh, personal and advertising injury, right? So now when we go back to the insurance policies is that there, there will be most likely than not uh, some of the exclusions that are coming in based on these uh, factual core decisions that we've actually seen from uh, real data breaches. Yeah, and uh, you know, in certain industries like financial services that are you know highly regulated, the uh, there is transfer, like you know, going from uh, you know transferring your risk. Uh, residual risk to uh, a third party uh you know regulators look at you to owning the risk end to end that's why there's so many different supply chain risk uh, requirements and regulations that has been escalated uh, at the federal and state level that basically is enforcing these organizations like these banks that at the end of the day it doesn't matter you know if the third party fails you you have failed so that's kind of one thing but when it comes to insurance coverage, you know, with all the things that Andre you pointed out, from your experience, knowing that at the end of the day, when I'm attacked, I have coverage, so I'd rather pay. And of course, we know that guidelines from the government, including FBI, is that don't pay because you set bad examples. But at the end of the day, even FBI points out that, you know, at the end of the day, it's your business decision because obviously there are situations like in the case of hospitals, we know that there's a life and death situation if they're, you know, uh, encrypting clinical data, as an example. But from your experience, you know, what are, what percentage of these types of uh, ransomware attacks they actually pay and move on versus um, versus negotiate and kind of, you know, try to restore? Sure, it's a it's a really great question. And when you look at like a third party liability game or data information is being posted, um, the payments are really hard. We're looking maybe close to 90%, right? Because that just the third party liability trigger is really, really uh, the, um, the area that companies cannot avoid and the legal ramification or anticipation of litigation for such entities is not something that a general counsel or outside counsel uh, would actually get involved mm -hmm. to. And that's what we've seen in Akaseya too, is that basically because of the third party force they uh, purchase the general decryptor for um, everyone because that was ultimately the right thing to do rather than um, having the individual victims go through it. And a victim, for example, that we had, there was a hospital with uh, 500 beds in a Connecticut, few police stations, few fire stations. So um, basically like in a Kaseya, it's almost, you can think that, well, they probably would not want to pay, but how they cannot pay when now they're being basically responsible and they're, their insurance coverage is at the state, right? So mm -hmm. they, they need to do the right thing and the right thing for them is to basically help all these entities that are using their software and their software is now the vehicle that delivers that code. So they, because of the third party liability that they have to the customer of the MSSPs. So you have a Kaseya MSP providers and then you have the end customers basically, the third party liability that um, waterfall forces them to pay. And threat actors are, are evil, are very um, legally skilled, or they have good and clear understanding of why that company would pay. And we've just seen it here, but we're literally nicely unfold uh, attack by uh, our evil group. And um, they were just basically waiting to get paid and they knew they're gonna get paid. You know, the, uh, I think there is a question already out there in terms of, you know, what malicious payload was applied for this particular uh, attack. So it's actually right here. Um, you know, obviously uh, most of these attacks are through delivery of malicious update uh, pay payload to your internet accessible sort of servers. And or ultimately that, you know, the payload is uh, targeting 
uh, true variety of platforms you know, coming in, we call it North South, and then you know they can basically compromise various platforms, uh, East West, and uh, they leverage uh, some sort of a zero day. Zero day, as you know, is a, is a, is a, a defect typically in some sort of a system or software that has not been uh, patched. So by the time, you know, the vendor identifies, Microsoft identifies a, uh, a, a vulnerability that uh, needs to be addressed. By the time that vulnerability is, you know, affixed to that vulnerability is deployed and uh, developed and deployed, tested and deployed that Time frame between that time frame, they, the bad guys identify that you as your weak point to get in. They call it zero day, right? So that's kind of how the initial access happened in this situation. And um, and if you want to take it from here in terms of the actual kind of dropping the base sixty four encoded file to Kasaya's working directory. Anything you want to add to that? If you're looking in here, that zero day we already described, and that's the authentication uh, challenge that Casaya um, uh, Safra has that the file upload and the command and control, right? So this bypassing the authentication, um, uploading the file, this, the, the chain exploit is basically what's uh, leverage here. And again, it's a question is, that was fine at the uh, SVR or somewhere else, and what agency should be contributed to, to that exploit. Um, one, one important maybe point that I'm in here that ultimately the agents, the piece of software called Kase actually runs these agents on endpoints, right? Mm -hmm. So if you drop something on a main server, it automatically propagates. This is no different as a water pipeline in your building. Someone drops something in a tank, everyone gets it. And these agents are configured to check with the main server in a period for a new upload, for a new download. And um, in the case of Kaseya, if you look at this um, piece of code, there was a piece of code, what we call the base 64 encoded, that basically was dropped into this working directory. Kaseya itself actually provided manually to exclude these directories from any protection, mm -hmm. just because they were deploying the upgrades to those directories. And they did not want security software to <laughs> intervene. So, so um, maybe sounds a little bit strange, but people who misconfigure the installation guideline of Kaseya they actually were safe from this uh, cyber attack. And also if uh, someone uses like a little bit more sophisticated software than, than the others, they'll also spare from uh, this uh, type of attack. Uh, in a third uh, sequence here, we see something, let's say more be more unique. One that piece of code is decoded is actually disable intrusion prevention system. If you mm -hmm. look at the line it says, disable intrusion prevention system true. So it's basically disabling protection, natively built protections in um, Microsoft operating system. It's uh, also disabling antivirus of Windows, uh, Microsoft Windows Defender, also control folder access, uh, network protection, uh, and submit sample consent, which means that if there's some kind of malware found, it will be actually submitted to Microsoft. So they're disabling all the component into it. And what you see at the end is basically something what we call the deco process or deflating process, and then basically deletion of that uh, uh, file that it actually came from. Yep, it's as you can see, it's uh, you know basically bringing down your lines of defense. Yeah, and it's a uh, truly done with the scripting uh, Sharia of the native operating system, and this is what we've seen from these more sophisticated groups. They don't really reinvent the wheel. Mm -hmm. What they're trying to do is they're trying to mimic a like, behavior of the administration on a system. Someone who would be truly a network admin, just writing the commands and executing these commands on a system. So they try to stay undercover as much as uh, possible. And in this situation, they also, you know, impaired uh, Windows Defender, which obviously has characteristics associated with um, network protection and variety of ways that. Uh, your system, your Windows operating system is uh, trying to detect and block these types of breaches by, by being able to really uh, exploit through a variety of, you know, bringing down your defense and then scanning through all of your downloaded files and attachments and 
and ultimately uh, applying a uh, some method of uh, encryption to it. Yeah, and this is a very important piece for them, right? So basically, yeah. disable whatever is in there, don't interfere, which also help them to speed up the encryption of the systems. Because once the antivirus software, Microsoft Defender, is not running, the Windows Defender is, is not actually active. The, scan, the, the Defender has a feature where it basically scans every action on the system, is questioning the actions of the system. Once they disable any questioning, basically it helps them to also speed up the uh, momentum of the encryption for uh, that specific enterprise system. Okay, and, and, and this one, Sharia, is a, something yeah. called a certain utility.exe. It's kind of like, there's no special magic into it. It's just one of like basically built in um, executables and uh, in a system itself. But lately has been really used by uh, threat actors to uh, copy and basically deploy the code. So that's why it's actually being in here. And again, this goes back to what we call technique tactics and procedures by this, uh, uh, by the threat actor. And it's been this truly living of the land tool um, that's uh, helped the threat actors to propagate the ransomware through the organization. This is just the example of the decoding of that agent.crt to agent.exe. And again, this is a common technique to use for uh, executables to basically being hidden before actually get what we call a deflated or decoded on a system. And um, it's very simple, simple trick and often uh, avoids that basically the initial detection or initial scanning of that system. Because as you recall, there, it's important for them to disable any, any of those components, right? And then, then basically for the trade actor um, to, um, to work in that mode where the uh, Windows uh, Defender is not actually uh, working properly on the system and it's, it's being uh, disabled on, uh, on that enterprise system. And as we learned uh, earlier, we talked about cleaning the tracks, removing the uh, encoded payload and temporary copy of uh, your executable, basically, you know, basically leaving no trace behind so that, you know, they can basically uh, apply the same method in other future attacks. And this is common, I mean, the threat actor usually, they, they truly love that, that um, uh, the cleaning part of it, right? Like they, they always try to mimic as much as possible. Yeah, and then of course, you know, going through this process, they come in with a valid authentication signed in uh, with a certificate that obviously uh, is unknown how the threat actor acquired the key required to sign this executable, which ultimately uh, this is when the file agent is dropped and, uh, and then the actual um, uh, code would a scan through your targeted environments, you know, directory systems, uh, you know, file shares, and start to apply the encryption against that particular target environment. And so here, maybe, Shara, it's important to know that what's actually loading a malware is Microsoft uh, Defender yeah, executable. And this is executable, if I'm not mistaken, from maybe 2014 and 2015 which has what we call vulnerable to DLL side loading and injection. So it's a very specific type of injections of the DLL right into that executable. So basically threat actors not leveraging some kind of code that they would create. They're actually using Microsoft code and Microsoft Defender, the tool that is antivirus itself. And we've seen also the same with the various nation state threat actors using actually security software for loading the malicious code. So this is important to note here that the trade acts are truly leveraging this uh, mpsvc.dll, which is ultimately the encryption, the ransomware into it through Microsoft Defender. And it has the same signature as you, Sharon, pointed out of the PB03 transport LTD. Um, one of the reasons that trade actors do that is that often unsigned programs are not able to run on the, uh, uh, on the operating system itself. Yeah, and you can see that the encryptor that they started, it modifies different components of your infrastructure, including firewalls, uh, you know, any kind of uh, network devices and ultimately local drives and even removable drives that are all mapped to your network drives. Yeah. And one more component to maybe add here, Sharia, is that um, this was very quick 
encryption. Just because that program for scanning is truly designed to be what we call the multi-threaded, right? So it'll have like a really high performance. This was also uh, very quickly done by, in terms of the encrypting the uh, systems itself. And you can see that, you know, significant level of automation as a result of this, not too much of manual uh, punching into the attack, uh, as well as the fact that, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, not, not being malware doesn't delete the volume shadow copies. Uh, the same thing with, you know, encryption process is multi-threaded and extremely fast. So you can see that, you know, basically once they're in there, they can do the damage very quickly. An important piece in here is that, uh, if you go to that slide, uh, was that there was no data exfiltration, right? So uh, basically the threat after here, it's not trying to exfiltrate the data from this organization. They truly just play that third party yeah. card and third party card plays a really uh, well for them uh, in this. And also yeah. Sherry, if something very specific what we call the uh, volume share of copies. Uh, yeah. And right now they don't even care anymore to delete this, right? There's something that you could actually go and recover but it's a very slow uh, recovery for these victims. And they know that a Kaseya most likely than not will pay because it's ultimately a not, not feasible way for these companies to uh, actually recover. So there are some guidelines, uh, just to be cautious of time here, we have uh, close to uh, 17 minutes. So uh, from a standpoint of FBI guidance for MSPs and their customers, uh, specifically that were affected by Kaseya VSA supply chain ransomware attack. Uh, there are some downloadable Kaseya VSA detection tool that and this, this type of tool analyzes the system, determines whether any indicators of compromise are present. Um, there are also other recommendations like, you know, enforcing multi-factor authentication on every single account that is under the control of the organization and enabling and enforcing multi-factor for customer facing services. Obviously, you know, having second layer of securities, you know, you know supports the concept of uh, defense in depth, uh, implementing uh, and allowing, you know, certain type of whitelisting, uh, to limit the communication in terms of, you know, remote monitoring and management of, uh, you know, various known IP addresses that you would be able to uh, block off, uh, placing some administrative interfaces of RMM behind a virtual private network, the VPN that ultimately incorporating VPN uh, or a firewall on dedicated administrative network. Again, this is focusing on a subnet of your network that you're trying to ultra protect, you know, as with every other types of uh, ransomware, making sure your backups are up to date and it's stored in uh, some something that you can actually bring it and, uh, you know, uh, restore your information, make sure, you know, because a lot of these types of ransomware attacks, they also, uh, you know, not only encrypt your data on your primary servers, they actually, uh, have a way to um, encrypt your backups. So that's something that you need to watch out for in terms of ransomware restore if you go through that process. And of course, anything that has to do with uh, manual patch management process, because in this situation, since you've turned off certain um, components of your infrastructure, including bringing down or isolating your servers, you ought to be able to have a process in place to be able to actually do install of some of the new patches, uh, you know, on a, in a manual basis. And, and ultimately, Sherry, also, if you look at the um, advisory, mm -hmm. anyone should really be aware that threat actors like are evil, they are able to read the manuals. And if manual says exclude some folders, do something with this. So I think one of the new norms also is do not follow the complete standards of the manuals, especially if you're deploying third-party software, don't deploy it exactly the way, make your own tweaks into the deployment. And the companies who have done it, like for example, that Canaric provider, that MSP provider, only 20% of his customers got encrypted, only 20%. So not everyone was encrypted. I would say more than half of them did not encrypt it because it was improperly configured, right? So that you don't wanna do that too, but in this case, it's uh, 
that in proper configuration really uh, truly save them from not being encrypted. But ultimately, the, the systems had different issues than uh, than, uh, than than ransomware uh, in them. So in a way, they unintentionally hardened hardened their so their acquired software. <laughs> Exactly. They created a hardening process by not doing the things right. <laughs> exactly. Um, it could be hit by something else, right? Like you never know. It's just this one did not apply to it, but something else could be really catastrophic for them. Exactly. And you can see again, you know, typically when you're in a situation like that, you want to isolate the problem and don't let it bleed into the rest of your environment. So, you know, on-prem SPSA service should continue to remain offline until further instruction from Kesaya about when it's safe to restore the ops operations, you know, and a patch of course would be required to install prior to restarting the servers and some of the uh, recommendations uh, as it relates to your security posture. Customers who experienced ransomware and receive communication from attackers should not click on any links and they they may be uh, weaponized those those types of links and, and if you look at the uh, last one like the ilc's what we call the indicators of compromise so we look at the initial system that we know of initial vector that we know of mm -hmm. and also the ioc so the hashes of the executables ip addresses sharia what you mentioned before that uh, perhaps the threat actor came from also the communication back and forth of the threat actor, the domains that have been affiliated with this, uh, uh, with this specific intrusion, they're actually all available on a GitHub. And I tell you, it's not very common, but this time the community really came together. I'm sure many of these were subject of the FBI grand jury subpoena, but the community really came together and published most of the information for victims truly just to help them. It was a massive attack that was, uh, on a Friday, or Friday or before the long weekend. So um, it was something that truly would not need to be addressed. And uh, there's some, again, guiding principles related to, you know, what we've covered uh, as it relates to um, making sure that, you know, you're taking the right steps. Uh, we, I think we've covered some of them, including uh, verifying your offline backups. Uh, or especially for critical servers, Every, everything again, as we talked about, is risk-based, right? So it's not a white paintbrush approach. You need to isolate where your critical servers and applications and data that needs to be ultra-protected and applying various set of controls, uh, including uh, network segmentation in different zones um, and, uh, and making sure that from a standpoint of access, uh, to your network, you're mapping your drives appropriately. And of course, check your incident response team, make sure that they're, they're ready to respond to a situation through various types of uh, tabletop testing, as well as, you know, continuously evolve your incident response plans, because those are the things that, you know, the, as Andre pointed out, the, the, the threats are, uh, continuing to increase and the level of uh, attacks from a sophistication perspective is uh, getting more and more uh, in a way that, you know, if you had a plan from a year ago, it's not valid anymore. You need to constantly evolve it. And, and also one, one thing to point out in here is the containment eradication isolation, as you, as you mentioned, Sharia, is, mm -hmm. it's truly the key, right? So how that security code will contain it, how the malware will be eradicated, and then uh, how to protect the lateral movement through the isolation of these hoses is, is crucial. And what you saw on the script is the threat actors, uh, Windows Defender, Microsoft Windows Defender serves that function. So threat actors are right into it and try to disable and they were successful to completely disable and disarm that system. So basically there was no barrier for them to uh, propagate laterally through the whole organization and do a, a massive encryption of the systems in very short uh, period of time. And uh, one more important is also this network share, shares that um, were mentioned here that mm -hmm. often the network share and map shares are shared to the resources. And sometimes there's no reason, good reasons to enable read and write access. So right. if the person is only downloading files, let them have only read access. There's no reason for that person to actually write anything into it. We'll have directories where they write to what we call the transfer directories and from transfer directories, we then upload it to the main storages. 
And in many organizations, it's not happening the same way. It's a read and write access. That's, for example, what happened at the Colonials. There was no reason why accounting computer would ever write any data to a pipeline. Uh, and uh, it's a common mistake. So um, have the separation of what that level of the access is at the system uh, turned to be crucial. Yeah, and that's very, very much common in a lot of industries and organizations, unfortunately. You know, what uh, Andre just pointed out is uh, identity and access management, RBAC, privileged access. These are the things that, you know, you really need to start to look at, looking at provisioning individuals and systems, not just individuals, uh, through the proper analysis of, you know, uh, the role itself and the level, you know, least privilege uh, access uh, for them to be able to perform their function. And most organizations due to, you know, lack of automation, volume, and, 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 and variety of reasons, uh, they haven't been able to do a good job really tightening up uh, that set, those set of controls. And that's pretty much it. I think we're, we're out of time. Thank you so much for your time and have a great evening or a great day and uh, looking forward for the next session. Bye-bye. Thank you really for having us.